Welcome to Madison Grand Rounds. I'm very happy and proud to um, introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Daniel Eppner is from MD Anderson, and he is really in Shreveport for tomorrow's AOA talk, which you're all invited to. It's at this time, but on the eighth floor lecture hall. Um, but since he was coming to Shreveport, I asked him, could you also give a medicine grand rounds? And there'll be different topics. So uh, if you enjoy today, then definitely come tomorrow. Um, his talk tomorrow will be on the power of stories to teach and inspire. Um, today, he's presenting medicine grand rounds with the topic being achieving greatness as a clinician. What would Osler say today? He's a professor within the Department of Palliative Rehabilitation and Integrative Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I met Dr. Upner about 11 years ago when we were uh, studying together some communication teaching techniques. He practiced medical oncology for several years before moving to the Department of Palliative Care. His primary academic interest is communication skills training for physicians and physicians in training and a variety of other providers. He uses narrative medicine techniques to teach communication skills. In recent years, he's contributed several reflective pieces about his own experience as being a physician to the Journal of Clinical Oncology, the Annals of Internal Medicine, and, and other journals. Many of our students know him uh, from their studies in empathic communication skills. Um, and one of the papers we've been using for several years now is uh, his paper on uh, the students know it. Uh, it's called a perplexing question, but they don't know it as that. They call it the why I sit paper. And that's just for the students who know it as that. So I'm so pleased when Dr. Eppner agreed to come talk with us today and tomorrow. So Danny. Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you so much for this kind in introduction, Dr. Marion. Uh, as Dr. Marion said, we met over 10 years ago at this workshop we were at. And um, it was amazing because uh, we met over lunch. And within 10 minutes, I felt like his brother. And he has this unbelievable magnetism, this ability to connect. And I detected it just over lunch. So I have to say, you're lucky to have him here. He's a master educator. I know he's beloved here. He's, he's like a national treasure. And I'm really happy and proud to be here today. Um, this is not going to be your grandfather's ground rounds today. Or you could, maybe you could say it will be your grandfather's ground rounds, because it won't be technical. It'll be philosophical musings today. And I want to talk about, I want to honor Osler's the, the centennial of Osler's death. So I'll introduce him and sort of share with you a little of his philosophy. And then let's imagine what Osler might have thought in this day and age, in the modern time, channeling the philosophy and wisdom of more modern luminaries in medicine and other fields. So here's the man himself. William Osler. And this is the institution that made him famous. This is Johns Hopkins Hospital. But he was born in Canada. He trained. He was in Pennsylvania for a while at UPenn. He was in Oxford. But much to the chagrin of any med who here is a medical student? And, and anybody in their second year? So you're, you're probably third and fourth year, probably already third year medical students. But you probably have horrible memories of last year studying for the step exam, right? And just pounding away at the knowledge. And you can blame Osler, because he's the one, one of a few at Hopkins, who developed the modern ed medical education, which consists of 
basically the first two years of science and laboratory training and then a very systematic way of training in clinical medicine during the latter half of training. Now, actually, this is brilliant. Despite all the heart act, heartache we go through to learn all this biomedical information and force feed this information, it really sets us up as physicians to perform at a higher level than anybody else at the, on the healthcare team to look at not only the humanistic part of healthcare, but also the scientific and to balance those two domains. Of course, back then, there was no Netflix, there was no HBO, and he was steeped in ancient philosophy and religion and so forth. That's what he drew on for his wisdom. He developed Hopkins um, with others, key luminaries listed here in gynecology, and of course Halstead with the surgeon who did the Halstead mastectomy, and Welch was a pathologist. He is perhaps most famous for these essays. One was A Way of Life, in which he encouraged us to live in daytight compartments, to have a system for living right. So when we get up in the morning, he would tell us we should have a system of thinking, reading, writing, talking, letting our brain breathe a little bit, exercising, eating right, having a system for life and not worry so much about the future or the past. We plan for the future, we learn from the past, but right now we live in this moment, like we're living right now in this grand occasion. He also wrote Equanimitas, or Equanimity, which is basically composure under duress. He had this essay um, in which he described this, and also healthy boundaries that we set between us and our patients. And I mean healthy, that is, we're not distant and cold, but we're also not family. We have to keep that healthy boundary to maintain our sanity so we don't burn out. We can love our patients in the right measure as physicians. Most people think of composure when they think of probably the operating room. We're all internal medicine today here. This is medicine grand rounds. But we think, okay, the great surgeon hits an artery, God forbid, and it's spurting, and they, they stay real cool, and they control the bleeding, that's composure. And I'm here to say that internal medicine, we need those very same skills of composure because our conversations, for instance, with patients about grave illness are just as stressful and difficult as when, you, when they hit an artery in the operating room. And I practiced oncology for a long time before I moved to palliative medicine. And these conversations that we have in oncology or palliative medicine about grave illness take huge composure. And it doesn't matter what field of medicine you are in or go into, composure applies to that practice. Osler was famous for talking about this duality, these domains, the different domains of uh, the biomedical, i.e. disease, and being technically superb, but balancing that against humanism treating the patient who has the disease. In order to be a great physician, because today we're not talking about you want to be an okay physician, you want to be a very good, we're talking about how to become a great clinician, a great physician, or a great nurse practitioner, or whatever your stripe. It's by balancing these domains really equally well and working in both of those domains. Hum humanism and biomedical technical. So Dr. Marion talks about singing kumbaya. You know, we, we're talking about connection and human connection, and that's the kumbaya moment. But that's never enough. We have to be technically superb. Um, as I said, Osler channeled the great philosophers of his day and, of course, antiquity, one of whom was Carlyle who essentially talked about those day-tight compartments. We should um, not focus on the dim distance, but do what lies clearly at hand. We plan for the future. We learn from the past. But our job right now is to focus on this moment. And we talked about this already. Now, let's talk about, let's imagine 
Osler, you know, in Johns Hopkins Hospital. And of course, back in his day, he would have been invited to visit other institutions too. So he would have hung out with a lot of people throughout the country, including his own institution. And let's imagine he had lived another 100 years, who he might have drawn from. Well, there's this man. You probably don't know who he is. He was my mentor in, in, uh, in my fellowship. I did my oncology training at Hopkins a long time ago. This is Don Coffey. He died about a year and a half ago. We called him the chief, affectionately. And he was really a charismatic, he was a great scientist. He described the nuclear matrix, a way of organizing you know, nucleic acid in a very systematic way, and how that structure, he published this in the journal Science, the nuclear matrix, and how that is integrated and resonates with the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix. Beautiful you know, conceptualization of structure and function in, in DNA. And I, he quote, he's quoted as doing, saying a lot of things. And I got to hear this all the time. It was a wonderful experience. But he said, what you're thinking about while you're coming to work determines your real interest and will direct your accomplishments for the day. And what he was talking about was the word passion. Now, this doesn't mean that every single day when we drive to work or walk to work that we're thinking about the lab or we're thinking about quality or we're thinking about you know, uh, patients. But I think you'll admit that if you think about most of the time when you're kind of walking along or you're driving, you think about the things that you're reflecting on, that's your passion. And he said, you should focus on that passion. He, call, he used to say, you should do the things that give you tachycardia. And he was from Bristol, Tennessee, so he had this really great accent. It was a classic accent. And he was very down to earth, but he was a really brilliant mind. He actually, he was dyslexic, so when he was a kid, they thought he wasn't very smart, but the guy was really brilliant. And as brilliant as he was in the laboratory, he was even more brilliant at connecting, just like Dr. Marion. So anybody, you can yell it out, because we have time. Like, there's, there's not that, I don't have that much material. But anyway. Who, who knows this? This is March Madness, by the way. Who was it? John Wooden. Yes, thank you. Anybody under the, under the age of 35 know who this is? Cool. How, I mean, how would you know that? Just... I watch college basketball. Okay. Wooden player of the year, I guess. He was a, yeah, he was a player. He was an English professor, but he was really one of the greatest coaches of all time, and he was... He was like the, at that time, he was like a, uh, a sports psychologist more than he was a tactician, although he was a great tactician. And so I like to quote him. And he said, you know, if, if Osler, so if Osler went to UCLA to visit, to give a lecture, he'd have to take the train. It would take him like, you know, 10 days to get there. But if, if Wooden were there, he'd love to hang out with this guy. Because Wooden said, don't try to be somebody else. Be yourself at all times. Now you're going, you're probably wondering, what on earth does this have to do with medical practice? And I'm here to say, it has everything to do with medical practice. Because in this, in this day and age, and for the last 50 years, all we do is glorify the science, which is beautiful. I mean, the science is really important. And the people with the most papers and the most grant money get all the the, you know, all the, the claps and the, and the applause. But Wooden and Osler would say, and Coffey would say, if you want to be a researcher, that's beautiful. You publish those papers, you get the grants. But maybe you want to be a QI expert. You want to run the most efficient, safest hospital, do it. Or if you want to serve the underserved and never write a paper, do it. You want to be a great clinician, great educator. Do it and share that knowledge. Be yourself at all times. Follow your passion. Do what gives you tachycardia. That's what great physicians and clinicians do. Now, this is also way before your time, but I was in high school when this movie came out in 1976. 
If anybody can name this, this character. Rocky. Rocky Balboa. And you're also wondering, what this crazy guy, Dr. Marion, brought in, like, what does this have to do with medicine? It has everything to do with medicine. Because remember in this scene, Rocky, you know, he's a, he works in a meat factory. He's a butcher, basically. And he has this long day in this freezer, get all bundled up. But every morning at 3.30, he'd get up and slam the raw egg. And then he'd be out on the mean streets of Philadelphia training because his dream was to be a great prize fighter. So this is relevant to us because greatness happens when no one's watching. I went to this beautiful musical performance in Dallas a couple of days ago. I was visiting relatives there. And the guy named Leslie Odom Jr., who's uh, famous for Hamilton, and he's a great, beautiful singer. He was up there with his orchestra, and they had the, the orchestra up there. And, and, the, and the lights were shining on this guy, and he was getting, we were giving standing ovations and everything. And I thought, you know, this is all wonderful. But when you and, and we, you know, stay extra on a Saturday, and we take, you know, tuck somebody in who's in the hospital and make sure that everything's just right, or if you wake up early in the morning with a burning question you want answered and you're looking on the electronic textbook or up to date, that's when greatness happens. That's like Rocky getting out at four in the morning running the mean streets of Philadelphia. So when you, and when you slam that information to study for the flex or your boards or anything, that's exactly, and, you, and we have to kind of accept the premise that greatness happens at 4 in the morning or 10 at night or whenever it happens. It could happen, you know, at any time. But we're not going to always get applause. Sometimes doing the right thing for people isn't very, isn't very popular. So here's Wooden again. He said, if I'm through learning, I'm through. And that is so true. And I can attest to that because as Dr. Marion said, I started off as a basic scientist, and that was really exciting. I just loved creating new knowledge. I loved being in the laboratory. Over time, I just became more curious about the human connections, and I, left, I let my career evolve. And so you can let your career evolve how it evolves, follow your passion. And also, this quote from Wooden speaks to our interaction with our patients, too. Because we constantly have to be learning about our patients, learning from them, not just teaching them. Here's coffee again. We used to call him the chief. You know, I, I think it's interesting because he, um, he, you know, of course, was at Hopkins. And he occupied what, a, a suite in the old building. And I can imagine coffee running into Osler in the hallway. And they would have been best friends. They would have been like, because Osler was very prim and proper. He probably had some weird accent, sort of Canadian accent. And here was the chief, Don Coffee, from Bristol, Tennessee, with his Bristol, Tennessee accent. And you know, I can imagine them running into the hallway and coffee saying, you know, Billy, Billy, you know, I, I want to tell you about this nuclear matrix I just discovered. And Osir, and, and, and it's this, you know, organization of DNA in this, in this structure, and it's integrated and resonates and with all the ECM and all that. And I think Osler would have said, you know, that's all well and good, but, you know, what's DNA? <laughs> but um, I think they would have loved one another because they would have complemented the styles. He used to say, if this is true, what does it imply? I love this quote. Every datum is screaming to tell you something, but you must do the listening and thinking. And he, of course, the chief, Don Coffey, was talking about the laboratory. Every datum is screaming to tell you something. He used to say, set up a simple experiment. Don't do a 100-tube experiment. Set one up with a, all the controls, a couple of experimental conditions, and answer a simple question. And, the, and whatever time it took to set up and do the experiment, Spend twice or five or ten times more time thinking about what it means, interpreting the data, and being honest and open and objective about what the data mean. What's so beautiful about this quote is it applies equally well to the clinical milieu. 
So every datum, I, you walk into a hospital room, and the shades are drawn, and somebody's withdrawn and you know, lying in bed dispassionately. And the question is, what's going on? Or if somebody says, I hurt. Well, I hurt could mean a, a million things. Does it mean they have nociceptive somatic cancer-related pain from a bone metastasis? Or does it mean they have this deep well of existential suffering or everything in between? So the data, we're there to collect data and interpret it. The clinical data are as nuanced and as complex as any biomedical experiment you run in the laboratory. It's our job to interpret the data through their stories and open, open, our openness to them. This is Yogi Berra, the great philosopher. They called him Yogi for a reason. And um, they called him Yogi because he looked, he sat in the dugout, he looked like a Yogi from India. But it was a, a fitting name because he was this philosopher, he was this Yogi. He said, you can observe a lot by watching. And that's true, and you can observe a lot by listening, listening to patients, listening to one another. Now this is my fancy scientific graphic for the slide, for the, for the talk. This is high tech, you know? These are the data. And my question for you is, what does it mean? If this is true, what does it imply? Say that again? Listening and talking. Okay, so the red is 75%. In the ideal clinical conversation, and it was saying that there's two parties. There's the, the healthcare provider, let's say a physician or nurse practitioner, whomever, and then there's the patient family unit. That. So who should be do, doing most of the talking? Patient, family, right. So that's not always the case. But um, this is, I, I think, overall, it's a good principle to live by. And I think another point about this, this scientific, this very high-tech slide, is that you know there's two experts in the room. There's the biomedical experts, us, and then there's the patient and family who are experts in their hopes, dreams, perspective, fears, wants, anxieties, etc. And there's the only way we can tap into that and learn about them. And as Yogi would say, you know, you can learn a lot by watching is by opening up and letting them tell their story. Here's Wooden again. And I showed the little graphic. And I highlighted that he said, never lie, never cheat, never steal. What's beautiful about this is, again, it's philosophical, but it's so applicable to what we do. And you're thinking, this is silly. This is trivial. Why is this guy talking about this stuff? And you think, we don't lie. And think about it. I'm an oncologist. OK? Um, imagine, do onco I mean, lying is relative. So if an oncologist says to a patient, Imagine a patient with stage four pancreatic cancer, heaven forbid, we see them all day at uh, MD Anderson. And the patients receive four different lines of chemotherapy. And now they're bedridden, they're very debilitated, and they really, it's obvious they can't receive more disease-directed therapy. And the oncologist enters the room and says, Mr. Smith, here's what we're gonna do. We want you to go home, take physical therapy, build your strength back up, and eat as much as you can, put some meat on your bones, come back in two weeks to my clinic and we'll talk about therapy. Now just think about that, if anybody, show of hands of anybody here who's worked in oncology in any capacity, been around an oncologist, obviously Dr. Marion. And so I'm an oncologist, I'm not dissing oncologists, but when an oncologist says that to a patient, there's no polite way of saying it, they're lying. Now they're doing it with really good intentions. We oncologists, we, we love our patients. We want to do this to maintain their hope and we don't want to break their spirit and we wanna, don't want to make them depressed. But the literature shows that people need the truth, they want the truth, but it has to be delivered compassionately. 
So when Wooden said something as simple and pithy as don't lie, it applies to us. And the key is to get the skills and the nuance and the reflective ability to, to, to tell the people the truth in a way that's uh, compassionate. Let's talk about emotion for a minute because you can imagine whatever your chosen field, and, and I was talking to Lexi about this before, you know, even if, let's say you're a student, and you're not gonna go into internal medicine, doesn't matter. You go into ophthalmology, dermatology, radiology. Well, maybe not radiology. You know, maybe not pathology. But anything where you, where you deal with actual patients, they're, they're scared. And think about, like, I've had minor you know, procedures and stuff lately, and I was scared, even though it was really minor, and it went really well, thank goodness. But think about somebody who's got grave illness. They're, they're really scared, and, and the conversations with them, interactions are emotional, highly emotional. So imagine somebody who's speaking Greek. You want to communicate with this person, but you can't speak Italian to them. You have to speak Greek. It's the same thing with emotional conversations. When somebody, a patient is scared or anxious or sad or angry, we have to talk the emotional language. We have to receive that rather than talk biomedical. And you've probably seen, or maybe you've done this yourself, as we all have, we default to that biomedical. You know, let's try to fix a problem. And we fix when we can, but we can't always fix problems. So we have to think about, occupy that emotional domain when emotion enters the conversation. What do I mean by that? Well, the literature shows that empathic responding is one of the things we do worst in medicine. We're not good at it. And it's not, we mean well, we just don't have, we're not thinking that way. We're not trained to be in the emotional domain that much. Let's review this for just a couple of minutes. What is empathy? You're thinking, we all know what that is. Well, it's trying to imagine. You can't really understand what somebody's feeling and thinking, but you can imagine how scary it must be to have grave illness. Just kind of be there with somebody. Occupy that space with them in ways that we'll talk about. And there's, you know, there's this unlimited repertoire of empathic uh, phrases that we use, depending on the circumstance. And saying things like, I wish, or I can't imagine, ironically, are, are really, really empathic. Sometimes not trying to fix the unfixable you know, we cannot fix in this day and age stage four pancreatic cancer. We try, maybe tomorrow we'll be able to, but right now we do our best and then we just show people we care. So empathy is not the same as being nice. And falsely reassuring and being overly optimistic is kind of going back to that well-intentioned lie that we talked about before. It's the anti-empathy move that we do, we, we do it with great intention, but it really, it causes problems. And of course, when we speak, we wanna speak in an authentic tone. Bio, educating about biomedical information is that 25%, you know, this is what we know, this is what we think, this is our recommendations, helping direct people when they're vulnerable. It's like when I take my car to the, the mechanic, I don't know the first thing about cars. I depend upon the mechanic to guide me. And we have to do that with, we have an ethical obligation sometimes to guide people through the complexities of healthcare and uncertainties. But that's, a, that's generally a smaller piece and it's, it's not the same as empathy. I want to review this paper briefly, the, the rudiments of this paper written in the JCO about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And it's the acronym NURSE for, I guess they didn't have enough categories for doctors, so they made the acronym NURSE. And continuous statements are statements that we make that encourage more expression. And they come in this categories, according to the acronym, of name the emotion, understand the emotion, respect it, support, and then explore the situation to kind of find out more and create more empathic opportunities. 
here are some examples of respectable, respectful empathic phrases. And I'm here to tell you, some of these phrases are literally the most healing thing that we can do for a patient. And I'm not exaggerating. You might think that I'm crazy because, let's say, with certain curable conditions, we cure, and that's lovely. But, you know, in the scheme of things, what matters to us in life is meaning and legacy and how we're remembered and how we remember others. And these are phrases that, we, when we're authentic and honest, can do more healing than any medicine. I respect how hard you fought your illness. I'm inspired. And I say these things. I know Dr. Marion says these, says these things, and, and they are good as gold. They're powerful. When some, you, I'm sure you've all seen maladaptive religious coping. Somebody says, I trust God will heal me, and you know they're, they're incurable. The patient is facing imminent death even. And, they, and I think the, uh, the approach to that is, is to respect it and not try to fix that. Because people have, you know, hope is a totally different construct as long as they're making good decisions, healthcare decisions. So just respecting that faith. And I actually, I think of a, a young woman I cared for about a month ago. And she's a 20, she was 26 year old and she had some sort of nasty cancer. I don't remember what kind. And it was killing her. I mean, she had respiratory failure. She was there. She didn't have her parents there, but she, her boyfriend was present. And she was short of breath. She was on high flow oxygen. And I came in and I started talking. You know, I'm the supportive care doctor. I'm here to help you with your quality of life, talk about goals of care. And she started to talk, and she just had this sort of composure. She had Osler's equanimitas. And she was dying. She was this girl. I mean, I have daughters that are about her age. And I literally told her, you are a rock star. It's true. I mean, how she handled this, that moment, those days, those weeks, and however long she had was just unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. And that's why, like Dr. Mary and I were talking yesterday, our jobs are really hard as physicians. And you take your knocks in this business. And it's not for sissies. My boss, Dr. Barrera, who's a palli luminary in palliative care, he says, palliative care, palliative medicine is, is a contact sport. Well, the same is true of medical oncology. The same is true of any field you go into. It's a contact sport. And so you know, it's, it, most days are tough. But when we see when we're inspired by patients like this, it keeps us coming back. It recharges our batteries. Plus watching TV at night and relaxing, that's, that's the other thing that, re that recharges. Respecting somebody's relationship, like when I see a mother who's surrounded by children, I often say, you must be or have been a great mother. And it's really funny to, to say that because, you know, oftentimes they have been a great mother, but a lot of times it's like, well, I guess I was, you know, and then the, the kids, it's funny what you get from that because the kids will say, yeah, I, there was tough love there, but yeah, I think overall she was a good mother. You know, it's like, anyway, it's interesting what will come back at you. You set a great example for your children. These kind of legacy statements are, are very powerful, very powerful, as long as they're authentic and they fit. Here's examples of I wish. And, so basically, if you say I wish in the right circumstances, in the right way, it's always empathic, as long as you're not kind of BSing somebody. I wish we had better options for you. I'd like to stick that quote in every oncologist's lab coat pocket and let them pull out the card and, and say that at the right time. And again, I'm not dissing oncologists. I'm one. But I think we need to do a better job of being honest in a very skillful way, compassionate way. You see these other phrases. Um, these are validating empathic phrases. Who wouldn't be anxious under these circumstances? I'd be worried if you weren't anxious. Of course, that's completely normal. Let's talk about what to do about that. Let's talk about breathing, relaxation, maybe some medications for when you go into the MRI scanner. 
I can only imagine, or I can't imagine. You know, sometimes we make the mistake of saying, I know just how you feel. My mother had such and such a cancer, or I had such and such a can or cancer or condition, so I know just how you feel. It's kind of the anti-empathy move, because we really can't understand how somebody feels, and it's deeply empathic to say, I really can't understand, I can't imagine, but I want to help you live the best way you can. These are supportive, empathic phrases. We're not going anywhere. We're going to take care of you no matter what. We hope for the best, but we're going to be here no matter what. And the other thing that's about palliative medicine, we're like the Rodney Dangerfield of medicine, like no respect. Because, you know, people, like I'll, I'll meet somebody socially, and I'll say, yeah, I'm an oncologist. I practice palliative medicine. And they look at me and go, palliative, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're the guys who help people die better, right? And I say, no, we, we help people live better. It might be for an hour, a day, a month, a year. It could be 100 years. But our job is to help people live better. And that's really empathic to just focus on. It's kind of like going back to Osler's living in daytight compartments. Our job is to live in this moment. Our job is to help you or to, for you to help yourself live the best you can in this very moment. So here's Osler, the great, the great clinician. You see his stethoscope. And back then, they didn't have Apple watches. So he kept his watch in his pocket here. Very stylish. And guess who's in the forefront here, foreground, is a super important member of the team, the nurse. And even Osler would acknowledge that he needed a great team around him. And that's true of our teams. The nurses are just as important, the, psych, the social worker, the chaplain, etc. They're just as important as we are. Now, in many circumstances, the physician is the leader of the team. That's fair, because we're ultimately responsible for stuff. When stuff happens, who do they turn to? The physician. But it doesn't mean that anybody else, I mean, everybody else is just as important. The great Wooden said this as well. Wooden was incredibly successful as a coach. He won like 10 national championships. He said, surround yourself with smart people who will argue with you. You know, you want honest but well-intentioned feedback, people who won't just say yes to everything. Because you learn more from those people. The other thing that was so great about Wooden he said the main, main ingredient in star, to stardom is the rest of the team. Now, can anybody name? You've got the basketball freak back here who knows everything about basketball. But do you know who the most famous player that he recruited was? Yeah. And his name at the time was? Lou Alcindor. Right. So he, he sat Lou Alcindor down. So you, that one, you, you got him. You were faster. Right. <laughs> So Lou Alcindor was, he was the highest scoring player in the NBA, and he became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And Wooden sat him down in the beginning and said, you know, welcome to UCLA. I'm sure you like the weather here in LA, because Lou Alcindor was from New York, this really tall kid from New York. And he said, here's a couple of things. First of all, you're a freshman, so you're going to play on the freshman team this year. You know, we got, we're glad you're here. But you're going to go to the mess hall on time. And if you don't show up and if you break curfew, you're going to be kicked off the team just like everybody else. And he set that tone. And I think that same tone is applicable to how we practice medicine and to health care organizations even more so. I love this, this picture, because this is Redonda Miller. And I can imagine Osler running into her in the hallway at the great Johns Hopkins, because she's president of that that famous institution. And if Osler had run into her in the hallway, he might have mistook her back in 1915 for a nurse. It would have been a fair assumption. But I think he would have, once he figured out that she was a physician, he would have said, you know, it's, it's about damn time. It's all long overdue. This is great. And I think it would have been fun for her to like assign him to run the introduction to patient class or something for the, the med students. But he would have really appreciated having a colleague in this woman who, this, this lady, Dr. Miller, is not a great scientific scholar. What makes her great as a physician 
is her ability to bring people together in teams. And she's very charismatic. She's very bright, of course. But her, her brilliance is in bringing people together and connecting. Now, this quote from Wooden is so relevant to medicine. He said, he would say, if, if you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it over? And it's like the old, when I was in med school, we used to hear this little quip, never time to do it right, always time to do it twice. You ever heard that? It's an old thing from surgery. Because you know somebody who didn't do surgery correctly the first time, they have to take them back to the OR. It's exactly the same thing in internal medicine, too. Because again, I can reflect on oncology. In oncology, everybody says, I, I don't have time to have these conversations about goals of care. I have this clinic. It's 30 people in my clinic. I have 15 minutes. I have to rush, rush, rush. And the truth is, we oncologists don't have time not to have the conversations. Because if we have good conversations for five or 10 minutes incrementally over the trajectory of illness, we not only save time in the long run, huge amounts of time, but we reduce suffering tremendously. So Wooden would have told us, have these conversations honestly, don't lie, learn the skills, and then you'll save time and, and suffering in the long run. And Osler again talked about day-tight compartments. He used to say, it's not about the money. It's not about the grants. It's not about the papers. You can lose when you outscore somebody in a game, and you can win when you're outscored. He used to say, don't look at the scoreboard. Don't worry about how many papers or grants you have. If you have passion and if you get tachycardic about something, you'll want to write about it. You'll want to get more research money to do it. Or if you want to improve the quality in the hospital, you'll create programs around quality or public health or whatever you do, informatics, whatever it might be. So enough of that. Here's Yogi Berra again. He said, you know, he, he'd have a, he'd stop hitting for a few days. He was, a, he was the MVP of, you know, three times. He was in the Hall of Fame, but he had bad days. And, he sa and somebody would say, Yogi, how do you explain the slump you're in? He goes, slump? I ain't in no slump, I just ain't hitting. There's a huge difference. Because a slump implies something was wrong with Yogi. Yogi ain't performing. There's something inherent in Yogi. And he says, no, I ain't in a, no slump. Tomorrow I'm going to be hitting good again. And he, he would, because he had this great attitude. And this is so relevant to us, because academic medicine or any kind of practice is fraught with pitfalls and challenges and rejection. So I've turned in manuscripts before. And sometimes I get lucky and they kind of get in pretty quickly. But most of the time, it's like giving birth. I can imagine, or I should say, I can't imagine. I can't imagine what it's like to give birth. But you know, you put, you put the manuscript in. I'm sure you've had this experience. And, and the reviewers just like slap you down. You know, they, they beat you down. But then they, they give comments. And it's like, you know, I get really angry at first. And then I put the comments in a drawer, and I come back a month later and go, you know, those are really good comments. I rewrite the paper, I turn it in again, and it gets slapped down a second time. And then they give me more comments, and I read it, and I go, you know, they're right. And then, I'm, you know, eventually, I write the paper, and it's a lot better at the end than it was in the beginning. So Yogi used to, you know, study the pictures. He'd work on his fundamentals and mechanics come back the next day and you'd be hitting again. It's the same with us in medicine. Don't let the rejection, if, you, if, uh, if, re if rejection, um, you know, if you don't like rejection, then you're in the wrong field. I also take inspiration from great music. And this is a group that I think is a pretty good group. But I love this song. This is a beautiful song. Show of hands for anybody who's heard this song. Dirt, you got to look it up. Get it on Spotify. It's a really nice song. And they, they talk about the ephemeral nature of life. You came from dirt, and someday you'll return to it. And that is relevant to our profession as well, because it speaks to the endless cycle of life and the fact that with, with every birth, everything that is born is alive, that metabolizes oxygen, dies. 
And that's relevant to us because we can't fix all the problems. I can't, I can't fix pancreatic cancer yet, and I can't fix everybody's deep existential suffering, but I can relieve the suffering that I can relieve. If I can't feed 100 people or if I can't solve all the problems of my patients, then I'll feed just one. Just do what I can do. Gandhi said the very same thing. To give pleasure to a single heart by a single act is all powerful. So don't, don't get, you know, uh, believing that, we're, that our job is to fix everything in this world or fix everything for our patients. We fix what we can. We're biomedically superb. We care for them. And we, we love them in our own ways. And then we move on and we don't own all the problems. So it's really about caring. It's about showing we care. Uh, tomorrow, for those of you who can come to the AOA lecture, I'm going to have some uh, film clips if the te technology works, which I think it will. But there's some film clips in there that show, you know, from a modern film, the power of caring, simply caring, not fixing anything. It's more powerful than fixing sometimes. MLK talked about the power of love. We're not talking about romantic love. We're not even talking about familial love, even though that's really important. Wooden talked about familial love. He said, the most important thing in the world is family and love. He spoke to the balance we should, that great physicians, great clinicians strike in their lives, where they're not only about the grants and papers and patients and informatics and quality initiatives. They're really, they give time to the people in their close inner circle, the people who love them and who they love. That's really important. It's, it's critical to maintain that balance because, as I'm, per I'm sure you've heard, nobody's going to remember how many papers you published on your deathbed. Your kids are going to want to remember the times you had with them. Your kids or who's at, whoever's in your family, whatever your unit looks like, doesn't matter. The people who you love. I mean, this is my last slide. And I want to end with, and I think we have a few minutes uh, for comments and questions. Um, I want to end with this beautiful, because as Jay was saying, I've written some reflective pieces lately, and I, I use narrative medicine uh, to teach communication skills. And this is a paper that I came across when I was facilitating the Healer's Art course. Do you all have Healer's Art here? So not here, but at Baylor and UT and Houston, we have this Healer's Art curriculum. You have essentially the same thing with your with humanity studies. Um, it's an elective. But anyway, Richard Weinberg, if you look him up on PubMed, he is truly a gifted writer. And this is one of the most beautiful essays you'll ever, ever read. He's written a lot of good ones. Um, this is the final paragraph of this beautiful paper. He said, in the practice of our art, we're each like a solar system, our patients revolving around us like planets around a sun. Sometimes some whirl furiously in close orbits, seeking our warmth. Others circle more lazily at a distance. And others, like comets, streak through our reach only once in a lifetime. What keeps them all from spinning off into the cold and lonely vacuum of space is the gravity of our love. And I'll stop with that and take any questions or comments. Thank you. Dr. Mary. I have a comment because you actually tied in two things very well. Um, the fact that doctors do oftentimes have trouble being completely honest. We kind of whitewash, say, yeah, go home, gain some strength. And then I want to tie that into your use of wish statements. I think for many doctors, the reason we slip into giving premature reassurance or whitewashing is because we think our only option, we might think our only option is to use sorry statements. And the trouble with sorry statements is when you say you're sorry, you're either apologizing or you're reflecting pity. So if I have to say to somebody with that stage four pancreatic cancer, I'm sorry to tell you I've got nothing else for you, that lands a lot harder than I wished I had something better to tell you. So I think 
hearing you talk, it connected those two things. And I think if all of us could use wish statements more than sorry statements, I don't think we'd have to follow it with that whitewashing. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a great point. And I'll segue it by saying that the words, I'm sorry, we have nothing more to offer you, is always a lie. It's always a lie because we can always be present. We can help relieve suffering. We might treat symptoms. But saying we nothing, have nothing more to offer is always a lie. I guess it was clear. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for your attention. Thank you.